groups in the past. I have done a lot of indigent criminal defense uh, work. I have done some uh, defending some civil RICO cases involving forfeiture actions uh, through the years, uh, typically most uh, frequently involving uh, the use of coin-operated amusement devices, things of that nature. Uh, I'm going to let my co-panelists introduce themselves uh, and introduce himself here in a second, but this is uh, Civil Asset, Asset Forfeiture Overhaul in Congress, also known as Cash and Cars. Uh, and uh, Corey, you want to tell them about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Corey Rosenberger. I'm an assistant district attorney in the Conestoga Judicial Circuit here in Georgia. That's Whitfield and Murray County. Um, I've been practicing uh, criminal law ex exclusively for about 10 years now. The first four years of that, I was a public defender um, representing indigent defendants um, in criminal cases. Um, and then I swapped sides, actually, and now I'm, I'm an assistant district attorney prosecuting cases, and I've been doing that for about six years. Um, specifically, I am the um, assistant DA in my circuit that handles asset forfeitures. And so I've been doing that for about three years now. Um, and so I, I know a good bit about the state law, um, which kind of mirrors the current federal law. Um, and so I'm excited to be on this panel. And we didn't hear any boo and hissing when you yeah. said that. So <laughs> that is a great sign. Um, uh, one thing I will tell everybody, well, actually, I want to tell you two things. The first thing is rate this panel in the Dragon Con app. Uh, I'm going to tell you, it's already going to be a great panel. So just go ahead and give it five stars while you're at it. Uh, if not, you can wait until the end and still give us five stars. Uh, the other thing is that we are both lawyers. Uh, Y'all are not our clients. Uh, you're not paying us money. We can give you general legal knowledge, but we can't give you legal advice unless there's an attorney-client relationship. In other words, uh, you can't go say, my lawyer told me to do X because uh, we didn't. Uh, and you technically can't hire Corey unless you back up a Brinks truck and get him to leave his job. So, um with that said, we're going to start with just kind of the general overview of what we're talking about. This show of hands, everybody know what we're talking about when we say civil asset forfeiture? Okay, everybody generally has a understanding, the basic contours of this. And one thing I'll tell you is, if at any point in time you have a question, come on down. Uh, me and Corey have done this a couple times already through the con, and, and we like questions, we do well with questions. Uh, but uh, this panel is, really supposed to speak to civil asset forfeiture overhaul in Congress, and that being the FAIR Act uh, that has pretty good bipartisan support. However, um, whatever reason, uh, even though lots of people agree that uh, civil asset forfeiture is something that we need to do, we get these half measures. Um, and I say half measure because the, the current problem is that uh, you have cash and cars being seized. Uh, the general idea is that if it is tied to a crime and the government decides it is tied to a crime, then they will take it uh, and you don't get to use it to defend yourself. You don't necessarily have a right to a lawyer uh, to defend you uh, in them trying to take it. And it follows different rules than uh, what it takes for you to be convicted of the underlying crime. And I think that's pretty true still for the state law. That is, that's very true for the state law. And can you can you kind of tell us what what that process is? Because you are, you have the view on the inside, right? So, um, uh, as I said, a, a typical asset forfeiture starts usually um, with um, I'd say eighty percent with a drug investigation, and we'll just go for that with that for today's purposes. Um, there are actually over forty different crimes in Georgia that um, police can. Uh, seize your property everything from proceeds of a drug transaction and profits from selling drugs to um anything used in associated with human trafficking computers cars you know any, anything that is used to further the, cr the crime to things as obscure as illegal dumping for rvs um, now I've I've begged my law enforcement agents um, in Georgia or in in my circuit if you are going to seize an RV because they are dumping their sewage into the sewer please let me know first um, because I, I, I you don't want to hear yeah. a problem yeah but um, we'll talk about drugs and I'll go through a typical asset forfeiture so let's say that officers execute a uh, a search warrant on a house. They find a, and I'm going to give a just a bulletproof case for the state. 
they find um, two kilos of methamphetamine, so two kilograms of methamphetamine, which is the highest level of trafficking um, in Georgia that you can get. Um, and they find $100,000 cash, four guns, and um, a ledger. And, you know, they do a search warrant on the guy's cell phone and see, you know, drug transaction messages going back years. Um, they will then take that money um, and seize it. Uh, in Georgia, you have to give, you actually have to give them notice of that you are seizing their property. Um, that's just due process. Um, that's required on both state and federal law. Um, depending on the value of the property, there are two ways to do it, um, to seize property. There's quasi-judicial, and then there's something called an in-rim complaint. And in-rim in rim means that I am actually filing a lawsuit against the property itself. Um, in Georgia, all you have to, anything valued over $25,000 has to be an in-rim complaint. Defendants get a little bit more protection that way. If it's under $25,000, I do not have to file a complaint. Um, all I have to do is serve what's called a notice of seizure on the defendant. Um, a notice of seizure has um, the crimes that I am alleging that he committed, the property that is being seized, and why I think it, um, why I believe that it is um, subject to forfeiture. It also, by statute in Georgia, I'm not sure about the federal law, but in, in the statute in Georgia requires that my notice of seizure also explain to them the process of, fi of, uh, of responding to my, my notice of seizure. Um, and that's by filing a claim. Um, and so uh, by law, they have to send me notice first in first class mail, return receipt requested. Um, that's more to protect them um, with saying, hey, this is my property. If they do not do that within 30 days, then it is more or less defaulted to the government. Um, now, going back to the in rim complaint and what, what our situation with, you know, $100,000 cash, um, I have to file a in rim complaint against the property and legally serve the defendant or any known or potential interest holders. Um, and so, you know, it, it's the same as civil law. I either get, you know, one of the, one of the beautiful things about these is that I have an army of police office of of sheriff's deputies ready and willing to go serve pe legally serve people for me because they're the ones getting the stuff. Um, but I have to legally serve them um, under the you know Georgia civil rules of procedure, I guess. Um, and then they have thirty days to file an answer um, in the actual lawsuit, and then they have a fifteen day grace period. Now, if they do not file an answer, then I can move for default. Um, default judgment um, is just when you do not file an answer. Um, and if that happens, then the property will be forfeited to the state without a hearing. In other words, Corey has took your stuff. Now, if you do file an answer, um, in Georgia, you're not entitled to a jury trial. Um, and it is up to the judge to determine um, whether the property is subject to forfeiture. Also, the burden of proof is far less in a civil asset forfeiture as opposed to a jury trial. Um, you might have heard different burdens of proof. Um, in a criminal case, the, the burden is always going to be beyond a reasonable doubt. It's one of the highest burdens in the United States. Um, in order for the government to take your property, um, I just have to prove by preponderance of the evidence. So that means 50% 50, 50 plus a little bit, just more likely than not. It's a vastly lower burden um that is basically the the overview of how the how the current system works the federal system works more or less the same way um there is an administrative way of seizing property and then there is the um fully judicial way of seizing property and we're going to kind of walk this back a little bit and talk about what some of the the overhaul things are uh and the, the first thing and we're not necessarily going to do this in the order of the bill, but you, you were talking about the burdens of proof. And one of the things the FAIR Act seeks to do is to change that burden of proof because in the federal system, it is a preponderance of evidence. And it's, it's basically which way is the wind blowing? You know, it, you, you always see the scales with us lawyers. Uh, it's the one extra grain of sand in this side, then versus this side. 
Um, it, it ain't a, you know, it, it ain't 50% plus 1%. It's just the little tiny speck that kicks it over. Uh, and so what the FAIR Act does is, or tries to do is, is to change that to what we call clear and convincing, um, which is not quite reasonable doubt. You, you can it's about you, halfway there. It's, well, it's a little bit more than halfway there. I mean, it, we, we are taught by by our courts to not quantify reasonable doubt okay uh in fact they get very angry uh when you quantify reasonable doubt uh, and that's something prosecutors get in a little bit of trouble for sometimes and and defense attorneys sometimes in closing arguments when they start trying to subscribe numbers uh to what reasonable doubt is um particularly with some folks who like to say 90 percent um and you know you can't really quantify it but you know if it was something let's say Preponderance of evidence is 50% plus a little bit. Clear and convincing is probably around 80. Um, you know, it, it's more than just, oh, you know, you've got to basically resolve all the, the hanging out there that could materially affect it. And so switching to that type of burden of proof is helpful for individuals because it's the government taking your stuff. You have a Fifth Amendment right to be uh you know to be free from unreasonable takings of your property and that is one of your constitutional rights and when we're talking about the government being able to infringe upon that right and to take things um they should have to go to a higher burden of proof uh, according to the act according to what most people believe uh to be able to actually take it from you um now i will say this um there are instances where it's not that hard even at clear and convincing to prove uh that you have some ill-gotten gains and that would be you know if you've got two kilos of methamphetamine and there's i don't know in the closet with the two kilos of methamphetamine hundred thousand dollars in stacks and money counters and baggies and vacuum sealers and a bunch of pyrex dishes and um, a couple of salt rifles and you know some other stuff yeah. that, that, that goes to the whether it's a reasonable doubt or an unreasonable doubt I picked up like barbecuing or something instead. And, you know, it's a lot safer. You can still have the guns, <laughs> um, you know, so, you know, it, it's not necessarily that onus of a burden, even then for the government, really what just protects people is those, those fringe cases yeah. uh, where you see, uh, you know, okay, this is questionable, but you know, okay. You know, they're not stacking two kilos of meth in a closet with all this stuff. And really where it comes in is is not necessarily um, Corey wants to prosecute Ron for breaking the law, but let's say Corey comes in and says, you know, Ron is, he, he he's, yeah, he's not really a warrior. He, this is just a money laundering front for him. He's, he's running coke out. And so Corey comes and tries to take my house and my car and all these things. Well, look, my wife pays for her car, but it's in my name. Um, it, it's my name and her name. Uh, and she's the only one that drives it, except, you know, my five-year-old pretends she drives it sometimes from the back seat. Uh, but I don't, I don't ever drive that Honda Pilot. Uh, you know, what about, what about my wife? She's this innocent bystander, technically, if she's the one that's paid for it and it's just in my name and she doesn't know what I'm doing at my, my law office where I'm laundering money for some sort of coke operation, allegedly. Uh, and so... What what happens in those situations now, Corey, when, when you get that sort of third party claim? So those happen a lot. Usually it is uh, parents and kids. So um, I, you've got a 20, 21 year old kid in college who's, you know, dealing weed on the side to, you know, pay for spring break. Um, and his, you know, their mom is, you know, is the owner of the vehicle or joint owner. Um, so. In Georgia, and as well as federal law, there's something called the innocent owner defense. Um, and so the, bur the, the way it goes is I have to prove, the state has to prove that the property is subject to forfeiture. So it was being used to move drugs. Uh, we'll, we'll use the car, for example. Um, he, so he was, uh, Ron was you know, using the car to move drugs, but his wife didn't know. So the wife, after I proved that what Ron did, his wife would then have to prove 
um, that she didn't know uh, that he was what he was doing, that she had she didn't have reason to know what he was doing, should not have reasonably foreseen um, that she knew what he was doing. And then she has to prove that she is the actual owner. Um, usually when they come to court, I us- I just stipulate, yeah, you've got the title. I'm not like, I'm not going to fight you on that. You know, I'll stipulate that you own the vehicle. Um, generally, uh, when I'm looking at an innocent owner defense, I look at whether the person has a criminal history. Um, so that that's the should have known. So if Ron's wife um, knows that he's currently on probation for distribution of cocaine, I'm not going to feel as bad for her um, when she's letting him use this car and kind of just kind of my argument is that she's just willfully ignorant um, that he is uh, and using the vehicle. It's like a classic thing. Here, go up to yeah, the mic. Yeah, use her. Speed limit. Uh, he pulled over. He, to avoid problems, takes something out of his pocket, tucks it into your car seat. You got a clean record. He's spotty. You lose your car or what? Um, it depends. And you'll hear lawyers say that a lot. Um, if I can prove that if i can prove that you knew knew each other well then i probably don't have a problem with my case if i cannot prove that you knew each other well that if if you know hitchhiker. yeah it's just a hitchhiker um i i would probably lose that um as you didn't reasonably know now there there would be a question is of you know what a reasonable person you know seeing a hitchhiker on the side of the road you know would 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 that be a uh would it be would you reasonably know that that person wouldn't be have drugs on them um but that's kind of is a good segue into another argument that defendants have which is an eighth amendment argument um the eighth amendment uh protects against uh cruel and unusual punishment and unreasonable fines uh the u.s supreme court has previously said that civil asset forfeitures are subject to the eighth amendment as a, as an unreasonable fine a good example of that is if you have a, a you know, marijuana roach in your car and your eighty thousand dollar BMW driving down the road and you get pulled over, they find that. That is too. That's too much of a disparity there. I can't seize your eighty thousand dollar BMW over a marijuana roach. It's got to be, um, the the pretty much the the seizure has to fit the the crime. Um, this we, is we have a lawyer word called a nexus uh and this is a good opportunity to use yeah it. there has to be a nexus between the legal activity and the and the property being seized um but so in in that instance where you know you had your buddy or your you pick up a hitchhiker um you might it it might be it might not be reasonable to to say oh well you know hitch like hitchhikers are known to have drugs on them but I think you would win an Eighth Amendment argument that, you know, I, that is unreasonable given the, um, you know, the totality of those circumstances. Well, well, a far more likely case, like in my case, would be a friend who I don't know to be a particularly strong drug user, but uh, without my knowing did happen to take something and tuck it under the seat next to them Yeah, uh, because they thought it'd be better, less chance of being found hidden in my car than on their person because they had a record and were liable to have something come up. I knew nothing about the record. I knew nothing about the pocket contents, but it was an interesting day nevertheless. <laughs> uh, so what, uh, a little bit on um, police officers always want like bright line rules, like hard rules, because they can't go back to their car. And you know, a lot of circum- a lot of times they don't have time to, you know, either call me and ask me or, you know, research the law on their own. And so I've given them, at least for meth, uh, Dalton is like the meth capital of the world, um, carpet capital and meth capital, but um, carpet and meth. Yeah, um, but they. Uh, so, what I tell my officers for methamphetamine is that if you have four, if you find four grams or less of methamphetamine, and this is kind of in a vacuum. If you've got some guy that you think that you've got evidence that they're trafficking, and you know you, you just can't prove it yet, you need to come talk to me. Um, but this is just traffic stop. 
random dude, you find less than four grams of meth, the, the cap that I will say for law enforcement is $1,000. You can seize up to $1,000. Um, that is just an arbitrary amount that I came up with. The way I came up with that is that that is usually the fine that I impose on defendants when they are found guilty of possession of methamphetamine. Um, if they have between four and 28 grams, um, usually uh, it's up to $5,000. And then once you get into possession with intent, sale and trafficking, it just depends on the, the volume itself. Um, but for the little cases, I, I tried to give them, you know, a like a, a, a bright line to follow. If you if you seize five thousand dollars when you find a tiny little bag of meth, like I'm get, I'm I'm not I think that that is a violation of that person's Eighth Amendment rights to seize that. We've got plenty of time, so I'm going to pull a string that our friend uh, so cleverly gave us with his hypothetical. Now, as a drug prosecutor, what happens in the situation where somebody who's an innocent bystander? is driving their car they pick up their friend who throws the drugs under the seat and neither one of them claim those drugs they're most of the time they're both getting arrested and i'm left with a headache yeah and, um, and then does that play into your decision about a forfeiture so that is actually a an ethic a good ethical question um, that's why i pulled the string yeah that he gave us so uh the prosecutor so i can there are conflicts of interest um you'll hear attorneys talk about that all the time um and it is well i guess conflict give you two terms of art conflict of interest and appearance of impropriety so an appearance of impropriety happens when let's say someone um i say you know if you forfeit your hundred thousand dollars i'll drop it down to possession with incent instead of trafficking that looks a whole lot like a bribe um, and so what prosecutors are supposed to do is separate the case. Um, and so we do that as best we can. And so one attorney in my office will handle the criminal case and I will handle the asset forfeiture. Um, and I do my best whenever they come and talk to me, I say, you know, I'll, I'll tell you about the evidence. But as far as your plea recommendation, that needs to be up to you um, because that is one way. I, asset forfeitures are a very unpopular thing, and I really don't want someone from NPR calling me, um, asking me about my, to justify my actions. Um, and so uh, it, we, we, we try our best to split up the criminal case and the asset forfeiture. Well, and, and in terms of those two things moving along on two independent tracks, right. uh, isn't that part of the problem, though, is that, you know, you... In the instance where somebody has a hundred thousand dollars that's been seized, uh, that so like both cases being tried at the same time or right. being litigated at the same time, yes, because because you they they may be acquitted, uh, right. but the civil case may move faster, uh, and it's a lesser standard. They may be out their hundred thousand dollars, and they may get acquitted. So in Georgia, the civil case will almost always move faster. Um, in Georgia, there. Are, fairly strict timelines um, for prosecutors. Once a law enforcement agency seizes property, um, I have they have 30 days to report that seizure to me. And once I get it, I have, I think 30 days. Um, I always do it like the week I get it. And so, cause I know that there's a time limit, but I think I have 30 days um, to file formal forfeiture paperwork on that property. Now, in the NREM complaint, um, that there's still more time deadlines there. So that's six, 60 days from the, from the date of the seizure, um, the lawsuit is filed. The defendant then has more or less 45 days to file an answer. And then by statute, I have, I have to set it for a bench trial within 60 days of the last claimant filing their answer. Um, usually, criminal cases take upwards of four to six months in my circuit whereas these start to finish you're looking at three to four um and so most of the time the the civil case will outpace the criminal case and where that gets hairy for defendants is um the fifth amendment um for civil forfeiture or civil forfeitures are obviously a civil proceeding 
um, in a civil proceeding, and there's case law supporting this, that um, I, the state is actually allowed to call the defendant as a witness. Um, and so it is, it is amazing um, how easy it is to prosecute these when I can just call, say, you know, he's saying, you know, I'm not, I, you know, filed a, a claim on the car and he's saying, I'm not, I want my car back. I can call him as a witness and say, tell me about your cocaine operation. Now, he's still allowed to invoke his Fifth Amendment right, but the judge is allowed to take a negative inference from that. And so the judge is allowed to say, think, huh, I wonder why he is invoking his Fifth Amendment right. Now, if I were to... Andrance. Now, if I do that during a, a jury trial in a criminal case, it would be a mistrial before, before the words came out of... Before I finished saying the state calls the defendant as a witness. Um, that is a big, big no-no. Um, one of the biggest no-nos in criminal law. Um, and so it is... It would much help defendants if the civil asset forfeiture happened after the criminal trial and in georgia um that is not the case well and two you know in in, in the hypothetical i just gave you i mean a uh, hundred thousand dollars you know that's that's for most situations that's more than enough to cover the cost of your defense right um and when you remove that sort of property from somebody they're then either forced into a number of constrained you know constraints on their options they can get into the defense counsel sometimes they can get a, a lawyer for a cheaper rate or they could you know create a, a potential another conflict of trying to hire a lawyer who's going to take essentially defending the civil forfeiture on a contingency fee basis or some right alternative fee arrangement where they they get an interest in some other property or something like that. So, I mean, it you really are boxing people in on their options, and then you get to put the screws to them, what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. So we have a question. Yeah. So you were talking about how the um, there has to be a notice of seizure. How much of a notice is there? So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a physical document. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, OCGA 9611, if you want to Google it. Uh, but it has to give the name of the potential claimants the property being seized um first of all it has to be under twenty five thousand dollars to do the notice of seizure it has to, uh, under twenty five thousand dollars of of estimate the estimated value i guess mm -hmm. um so i'm going to try to do them all from memory uh name of the claimant or potential claimant the property being seized the crime um, alleged to have been committed the way that the property is subject to forfeiture, um, usually just proceeds of a drug transaction um, or a vehicle being used to move drugs. And then a list of the way I have to on the um, on the notice, I also have to list the steps that a claimant has to uh, actually um, file a claim um, to fight it. So there's never an opportunity where somebody's got their their in a compromising situation and then there's a there's a lag of time whether it be an hour two hours a day that they would have the opportunity to get rid of that 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 property property so um if they were able to get rid of it before the police generally the police are seizing property at the same time they're making an arrest okay so you've got both cases are starting at the same time right and they're but they're but they're going to be looked at, at the same point of origin okay um, and, and now and I'll, I'll talk to you because I, i've handled some ones that are a little bit different than that uh, mm -hmm. uh, there have been yeah. multi-jurisdictional civil rico cases involving coin operated amusement machines so what would happen is uh they would target uh and this was pre I think it was House Bill 482 or 484 back in 2013 and 14 that switched it to being regulated by the Georgia Lottery. But before that, uh, you would have these machine operator licenses and they would have 25 stores that you know use their machine software or their machines. And what would happen is there would be cash payouts in several of these stores or allegedly cash payouts uh, for people earning little tokens and they would go and get cash when they're not supposed to. 
And what then would happen is the the government would get wind of it. They would do a month long investigation. They would have undercover people go into various stores. They would figure out the connections between all these stores uh, to best they could. Same software, same vendor company, things of that nature are common ownership. And then they would do simultaneous uh, raids on all the stores uh, as well as the store owners' homes. Uh, as well as anything that was in the store owner's name. Uh, Mm -hmm. And so you would literally see teams of uh, sheriff's deputies and city police in five or six different counties working on a very coordinated basis. Uh, And they would have in one county a judge that said, we're seizing all this for civil RICO. It's all being taken. And they're not been charged with anything. Uh, And they don't get charged with anything for sometimes six months later. Um, But Not only that, what they did is they appointed receivers for the stores. So not only are we taking the stuff that's in your store, we're putting somebody in charge of running your business. And by the way, those receivers are usually people that charge a whole lot of money to be a receiver by the hour. And they go in and take your inventory uh, at like 250 bucks an hour. uh, And it gets to be unduly punitive really quick in that scenario and Mm -hmm. you are highly incentivized to forfeit stuff and get out Mm. interesting okay but they don't do that nearly as much anymore because georgia lottery now regulates coin operated amusement devices okay and then uh lastly you said there were 40 different um activities that could warrant seizure where would we find a list of that there i don't think that there is a comprehensive list uh pat PAC is the Prosecuting Attorneys Council of Georgia, um, and they provided a list to us. Um, after the, I can, I have a present, a PowerPoint presentation that I give to law enforcement. Um, and if after the, after the panel, if you want to give me your email address, I can email you that PowerPoint presentation that has mm-hmm. the the list in it. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just so the way that it's set up in Georgia is there is the Uniform Civil Asset Forfeiture. Um, procedure act and so all of the procedure is in one place Mm -hmm. but all of the things that say you know property is subject to forfeiture under um civil asset forfeiture ocga 91611 those are all over the u.s code or the georgia code most of most of them are in chapter 16 um, which is criminal um, but there are a couple that are outside of that and And i'll tell you in the federal level by and large what you see forfeitures, the crimes that you see forfeiture on, uh, gun crimes, felon in possession, possession of firearm by somebody is not otherwise supposed to have it uh, related to a drug trafficking situation or something like that, drug crimes and certain financial crimes, tax fraud, tax evasion, uh, money laundering, thing, things of that nature are typically where you would see a forfeiture at the federal level. Okay. Uh, and then my last question is, once the assets have been seized by the city because right now i'm dealing with uh tax liens deeds um private property real property whatnot um what happens do those two resources get joined together and then they're dispersed or what happens after everything's been seized by the city or the so in georgia that is uh mandated but it's funny i know all these off the top of my head because law enforcement calls me all the time saying hey can i do this with the money can i do this with the money it's ocga 9 16 19. Um, but there is a list of the things, the things that law enforcement in Georgia is allowed to do with the property. Um, and so generally what the stat, what that statute authorizes them to do is to pull the property together and authorizes it to them to either sell it or use it, um, for in-kind distribution. In-kind distribution is like if they, if they seize a Glock that is, matches like what they like what their uniform patrol officers use they're actually allowed to use that glock um, once it's cleared to be safe to use um like in as part of in their official duty so they can assign it to a a uniformed officer and he can just carry it as his weapon Mm -hmm. what happens most of the time is that the prop all of the property is pulled together um all of the non-cash or non-currency is sold um through in through commercially feasible means um, and then you're left with a pool of money. Um, there are then several different distributions of that money. The first distribution is to pay for any sort of fees uh, or court costs associated with the case. 
the next distribution is actually to my office. Um, I, my, the DA's office will get 10% um, after the fees and costs associated with litigation. Um, and then that the rest of that pool then goes to that law enforcement agency um, to be used for any law enforcement purpose. And any law enforcement purpose is defined in that statute. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. We have another question. So oh, it was originally the one he just asked, which is awesome. So I'll just build on that. So with what you're saying that the funds can be used, obviously, for kind of a lot of options. How does that slush fund? Yes, yeah, so I was going to say. How do you minimize conflict of interest there, like so that people aren't just seizing additional, so they can bring in additional revenue for whatever purpose? Uh, there's not really a way right now, um, and that's part. I think that's under actually the, yeah. part of what the Fair Act is trying to fix. Yeah. So, so under the Fair Act, where what happens is instead of going to the individual agencies, the funds would go to the United States Treasury, uh, which obviously. Or removes that conflict of interest because it's not necessarily that agency's money anymore. So, uh, big bad DEA officer uh, no longer gets to take the cash uh, in the drugs and everything else and the property and sell it and liquidate everything and you know fill up the coffers of the DEA to buy new toys and to run other operations. Um, but that is the the historic the problem uh, with this, and that's I, and then there there are some things that at the state level they are required to do, such as reporting and things like that. And certain amount of funds has to be paid over to victim advocate funds and, and programs like but that. They they don't have to. That's one but, of the options. Yeah. But I mean, there's there's buckets that you can send right. them to. Yeah, I yeah. mean, so. Uh, and and that is subject to open records where that money is going. Um, now, mind you, it's a lot more difficult at the federal level to find out where that money would be going, uh, because, um, for instance, Corey, how many people are in your office total? Uh, lawyers and staff. Oh, lawyers and staff, probably thirty. Okay, um, it is a whole lot easier to figure out where money's going in a thirty-person organization where they're distributing the money than say. Asking the ATF where money's going, um, and you can imagine why. Uh, it you know it's one's a big, 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 big bureaucracy. One of them is a thirty-person bureaucracy. Uh, not that you're a bad bureaucracy. Yeah. It's just you know, big, small. Um, if I have a mom and pop hamburger store, it's easier for me to explain to you where my every single dollar goes than, for say, instance, McDonald's. Um, but that's a great question, and that is that is the problem because. A lot of times that's what we as citizens perceive to be one of the issues is, well, you know, you take this money, what, what's happening to it? What's happening when you take somebody's property? Um, and we've already established that, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's easier to not fight uh, than it is to fight. If it's a large amount, you're more incentivized to fight. But if it's a lesser amount, if it's a, if Corey or some federal prosecutor takes my 1994 Honda Civic, uh, you know, I would cry about it. But, you know, 1500 bucks, I could go get another one. Is it worth putting down the knockdown drag out height? And I could, you know, kind of escape out of some potential criminal yeah. charges you know you have to weigh risk and and it's funny because i find myself actually apologizing a lot of times uh these people will call me um directly um and i'll talk to him and the first thing i say is the first thing he said to y'all is i can't give you legal advice um I, and and then i tell him i'm actually the person taking your stuff um but a lot of times i find myself apologizing to them because i know that you know if i'm seizing you know 750 dollars cash and they're I, it's highly unlikely that an attorney is going to take that case um, or it, for a cost effective amount for the defendant. Sort of related. Are there any cases under which cash can be seized by officers where there is no crime that has been committed? We've all seen the YouTube probably of the veterans traveling between states to visit relatives. He doesn't believe in banks, has a couple thousand dollars with them the officer says well we're just going to collect this in case there's a crime and you can come get it from us later that always costs him money and time to get it back uh how is this in any way conceivably possible apparently this is a real thing that happens but particularly people traveling between states 
where they're going to pass in one side and leave out the other, they'll be pulled over if they have a bunch of boxes or whatnot. And they'll ask, do you have cash? And an honest person answers, well, yes, I do. The officer says, well, you can come get us from us later. Is What's the, I mean, this is another state, not Georgia. So I, I apologize. Corey, what was it that you uh, gleaned from the panel the other night about police interactions? Oh, uh, yeah, you uh, uh, never, never consent to searches and never, you know, voluntarily talk to the police without an attorney there. Now you can answer yeah. how you were going to answer. Yeah. You know, go I, to the. I've I've got a good example um, to answer your question. So uh, one I one time um, a case in Murray County. Murray County is a very 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 small community, very rural, very poor. Um, it is off of the interstate. It's right before you kind of get to the mountains. Um, but they pulled a guy over for um, I think it was like weaving or swerving or something, um, and it turns out that he had a warrant for a proba a felony probation violation. Um, his vehicle was then impounded, uh, and then during the, during the process of the impound, um, they found, I think, $90,000 wrapped in pl plastic wrap that was then wrapped in duct tape. The drug dog tested, or, um, yeah. you know, affirmed All, all money again. smells like drugs. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it, uh, the, the, drug, the dog uh, alerted on the vehicle, but no drugs were found in the vehicle. Um, that the next morning I got a call from law enforcement saying, hey, can we see this money? And I said, no. What then happened was the best drug investigation I have ever seen from the Chatsworth Police Department, which is, you know, a very, very small police department where they actually they um, wrote a search warrant for his phone based on some other information. The search warrant, um, I think, was legal, um, but they wrote a search warrant for his phone um, and found actually found enough evidence after the fact um and me and my boss at the time went through it kind of with a fine tone fine fine tooth comb um and said yeah i think all of this is legal we ended up settling that case gave it was like 50 50. i get half so of the, the back the back fill to prove legal that's not poison it made me proof. feel dirty but it was yeah. it uh, under the letter of the law it was legal wow mm -hmm. and you'll find all attorneys um, kind of do that. They're like they're just doing, you know, what they're paid to do. But right. it's just a little defense on my part. So, but to kind of go to, I think the the heart of the issue there is, if law enforcement is taking it for purposes of a ongoing investigation, they have to return it, uh, and they can't just hold it indefinitely. Um, so. You know, the kicker in that case was that the defendant was in a, in was in custody for a probate of felony right. probation violation, so he couldn't be like, "Hey, give me my money back." Sure, but I was talking about the the original hypothetical. Oh, yeah, you know, the guy traveling between state lines, he's got a lot of cash and boxes, and you know that if they're investigating and they have a actual investigation, yeah, they can hold it indefinitely for an investigation, but. If they're going to seize it and take it and use it for their own purposes and not just for an investigation, they do have to provide you notice. Uh, and that's regardless of the overhaul, you know, they have to give you notice they're taking your stuff. So in that situation, if they do take it, um, there there is case law that says large amounts of cash in a vacuum like is not probable cause that you can't just say, you know, an officer's training and experience. Um, large amounts of cash are often associated with criminal activity. Um, courts you add in a that. money counter and baggies. Yeah. It, the, the cash in a vacuum is not probable cause of a crime. Um, but what, what in theory can happen is if they illegally seize, well, no, because then it would be a Fourth Amendment um, violation later. So I, I think you would be safe in that situation. Um, but again, it just depends on what else was in the car besides the money. They don't have a reason to search your vehicle. Don't give them permission yeah. to search your vehicle. <laughs> and don't answer questions you don't have to answer. You got to give them your name. That just looks really dirty. You can say it in a polite way. No. Yeah. Just say, listen, I've got somewhere to be. Um, that's what I used to tell my clients when I was a public defender. Just don't tell them you're traveling. Yeah. Just do not say I'm traveling and do not. Hey, just what are you doing out here? Where are you going? I'm driving. I'm... <laughs> Show them your license. Do not claim you're a sovereign citizen. It will not end well. 
will not end well. Next yeah. question. So the uh, the proposed performance, the uh, what's it called again? Fair Act. The Fair Act. Okay, yeah. So it seems like it's kind of getting talking about talked about a little kind of piecemeal here among a broader conversation. Could you kind of just lay out what all the elements of that proposal are and your views on them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and and uh, the the real kind of meat of it is it's going to well, it, it raises the level of proof necessary from uh, preponderance to clear and convincing. It one thing we haven't talked about is it it changes the IRS structure of uh, how the IRS can take things, and it's really designed to kind of protect small business owners. Uh, because guess what, small business owners kind of suck sometimes at the IRS end of things. If you're a small business owner, get an accountant, uh, unless you are an accountant, and then get a better accountant to do your accounting work for your accounting firm. Um, it increases transparency uh, with the civil forfeitures. Um, because it goes to the treasury instead of to the agency and provides for some reporting about what's being taken, things, um, some additional steps you have to do to say, hey, this is what we took, um, things of that nature. Um, it it does uh, prevent, uh, and, and I don't necessarily think this is necessarily the best part of it, but it does kind of kind of works a little bit better with the state system now um, or better than it does now it, it doesn't let you kind of skirt around the state system because you've got a federal seizure um and then it it provides for additional safeguards so that third parties and who have their stuff taken have a greater access to court so they can get into court to say hey this is my stuff and challenge again um i don't think it goes far enough um that's just my perspective uh i i'm the the belief that the civil forfeiture should probably wait it out until the criminal conviction is done uh, and that's just me. Um, I, I've got this weird libertarian bent in me. Um, but, you know, when, when you start talking about taking stuff, um, there are instances, and look, I've had clients that, you know, we've had forfeitures and we've dealt with them, things like that. But you, you've got to deal with, can you prove that it is, in fact, tied to this? And that's not an easy question to answer sometimes. Um, you know, if I am running, and I am not running a money laundering operation out of my law firm, I promise. I don't make nearly enough money. Um, Please keep talking. Well, <laughs> you, you can come look. Uh, in fact, if you want to try, you can you can take it for two weeks and we'll see. Um, but but realistically, you know, if if I was doing something like that, or if you can take the Breaking Bad example, the the dry cleaners or or the chicken restaurant, you know, how do you how do you separate? what amount of that is from the legitimate business this the front versus what amount is from the illegal business and and to what degree do they they overlap and cross over and how do you prove that and i mean do you ever get down the position where you're like well this is 70 30 operation here and uh, we're only going to see 70 percent of things instead of 100 percent of it because 30 percent of it's from a legitimate business it, it's just too messy it's just way too messy um, but, you know, if you're trafficking drugs, uh, more power to you. It's against the law. You know that. And you know the risk. You know, you could be put in prison for the rest of your life, which is not a fun way to spend the rest of your life. And you can have all your stuff taken. Um, you know, I, I'm cool with that. But I want you to be convicted by a jury of your peers or by a plea uh, prior to taking your stuff. Um, so I don't think it goes far enough. Um, so um, it, I'm a little conflicted uh, because. I love when it, I like having an easy job of these. Uh, but at the same time, I do find myself when I'm talking to opposing counsel, defense attorneys, and they're just saying, this is ridiculous. Like, I don't like I don't stand a chance. And I'm like, I know. I'm sorry. Um, I think that moving, making the state wait until after the after the criminal case is a good idea. Um, there are some risks to that because then it's always in the back of the defendant's mind. It, well, if I do take a plea deal, you know, that that evidence will be used against me in the criminal or in the civil asset forfeiture trial. So th there, there are pros and cons to both ways. I think it is more fair from a policy perspective to do it afterward. So I, I agree with him on that. And as well as the point that you brought up, um, asset forfeitures in theory are a, are a good thing. Um, at least in my opinion, um, that, you know, why should taxpayers be pay, paying for things when we can get known drug dealers to take some of the burden off? 
Um, and that's a way to change really the, the way that the regular public views these things um, by changing it from police being able to buy more toys um, to just, you know, teachers get a raise, like, especially in small government. Um, so in my, um, you know, Dalton, Murray County, I think I seized about a million dollars last year. Um, and that would be huge for small, like if you can give, take that instead of getting all the police getting, you know, new riot shields and batons and all sorts of toys to, you know, opening a new park or, you know, even just taking, uh, giving the people of Whitfield County a, a tax cut, um, even if it's just a little bit. But um, I, I think that that would really change the overall view that the public has on asset forfeitures. So I, I agree with both of those points. Well, and I, I will say this too, the two things, and then we'll take the next question. But, it, you know, there is still a problem with doing it that way, and that's that you don't necessarily have access to those funds to defend yourself, which could lead to you being convicted because uh, you can't afford representation. So it, it, that's, it's still not perfect, um, but I think it's a better setup than than the affair or, or what we have now. Um, but it, the other thing too is, you know, some of these are really easy decisions in my mind. Uh, and part of that's just because I've been in it, but, you know, let's say you are arrested for being a, 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 a felon in possession of a firearm, or you are arrested for a drug crime, you're a trafficking amount and you have a firearm and the government wants to take the firearm. I don't have a hard time saying, okay, you know, if you convict them, of a crime and they've got a firearm and they shouldn't have had it either because they, they were prohibited from having it, which, you know, yeah, there's some seven, there's some second amendment issues there. Yeah. But, you know, or if they're using in connection with a drug crime, I don't have a whole big problem with a firearm getting taken as much as I do somebody's house or money or cars. Um, but that that's just the, the, the more prototypical example I do is somebody's got a gun. They're not supposed to have it. Um, you know, I don't want to give it back to them. They're not supposed to have it because you know what they're going to do? They're going to go commit another crime because you're going to hand it to them and they're already committing a crime. Um, so. so one of the internal policies is, is the amount of money, is the value of the property worth seizing? So, I mean, if there's $20 in someone's wallet when they get arrested for selling weed, um, I'm not going to seize $20. Um, that's way too much work for way too little benefit. Um, but the one exception that I've told law enforcement is I it, I will seize any crappy gun that is associated with any case, um, especially, like I said, it's a small community like where I am, um, getting as many of those guns off of the streets um, as possible. And we they uh, they don't resell them in our area. Um, I've pushed them to just destroy them and they won't do that. I can't force them to do that. Um, yeah, it is a lot of money. Um, but uh yeah and on the second amendment issue um there are, there's law enforcement that will not seize the guns because they think that it's a second it i've told my officers in my area you know this is a two we both have to cooperate you have to seize it and i have to initiate forfeiture and if one of those don't happen then the property goes back um and a lot of times they just won't seize a gun and you know give it to the their you know brother or mom and just say hey he had the, well, they'll put it in evidence. They won't, uh, um, they won't, uh, just give it back. I would have a stroke if they did that, but, uh, they don't, they don't initiate see, uh, seizure paperwork on it. How did you become a habitual violator? They kept handing my gun back. Yeah. Um, next question. Uh, so that, that, uh, I like I love the fact that you're answering some of my questions before I get up here. It's great. Um, so the ESPN is working today. I'm a fan. Um, so there is a distinct difference between seizing and pulling pulling evidence and yes. the. Uh, can you can you speak to that just for a second to add just another layer of clarity? So um, you can you can seize property and have it in evidence at the same time. Okay. Um, however. Uh, and most of the time, that's actually the case. Uh, they won't actually distribute the property until the criminal case is done, because I need if if it does go to trial, I want to show the, ju the a jury the stack of hundred dollar bills that they found in the closet next to the two ki kilos of meth. Mm -hmm. And when he says done, he means that it's gone through a direct appeal and through a habeas corpus. Right, Corey? Yes. 
because uh, you don't want it coming back after habeas corpus and destroyed yeah. all the evidence. So um, they, yeah, I mean, it'll sit around for a while, a lot of times. Okay. Um, but uh, as far as the actual seizure goes, um, you you can you can seize property that's in evidence. I guess is you don't see it, you take it and put it into evidence versus property like the drugs itself. I'm not, mm -hmm. I am, <laughs> I really hope Whitfield County isn't selling the drugs that they seize um, for asset forfeitures. But yeah, but uh, they can see, they here? can, they can take property that goes into evidence and hold that. And there's a different set of rules for, no, you can't have that back. Um, it's being held for evidence, mm -hmm. evidentiary purposes. And that's a, that is a really, really hard standard. Uh, I don't know it off the top of my head. That's a really hard standard for defendants to to fight. Um, and it almost never. So it would happens. almost be better for the for the person with the property to have it seized officially, because then there's a clear procedure for re returning well if, that assets. If I and this has happened a couple times, if I say I am declining forfeiture on this, mm -hmm. my I have like a form letter um, that says. Please, it part of like the last sentence is it in the in the in my declining forfeiture letter is uh, if this property is being used for evidence, please do not return it until the completion of the case. Okay, I think the the only instance that I'm I can remember ever having where we were able to get something that was taken for evidence purposes uh, returned prior to the case being concluded was a cell phone. Yeah, uh, and it was after the phone dump had already been done. There's at that point, there's no reason for them to have the phone really mm -hmm. uh, once they've done the phone dump because what they really want was what was it they got in the phone dump. Now you think about that though from the the just the logistical perspective, um, phone costs a thousand bucks. You have to pay to get the process to to fight about it to get the phone, and you probably have backed most of your stuff up on the cloud or on a computer. So. Mm -hmm. Is it going to make sense to fight about that? Um, in the one instance that I had, it was an engine defense case, and it, it made sense to them. Um, mm -hmm. but for a lot of people, it's not going to make sense to go through the fight and to go through the expense of fighting to get. I mean, it's 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 a war of attrition. Okay, and then um, let last two questions. One, what is the amount of cash? Because I keep hearing different amounts of travel cash that are acceptable, like the ten thousand dollars. Then you get pulled over to the, you know, that gets seized. If you're you know, like, if I'm flying to the air through the airport and I've got ten grand on me, that gets that gets seized. If you know, in another case, you're talking, you know, rounded up ninety thousand dollars, but the, it wasn't seized. So how does that? What's the variance on that? So, um, are you talking about like the DEA stuff that in the airports? I'm just in general. What's the and and then who gets to decide? Because I don't know if it's. I'm just traveling between here and I'm driving to Colorado and I get pulled over in St. Louis and they say, Hey, what's in the, you know, what's in the bag? Um, so the, I, to my knowledge, there's nothing illegal about, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend doing it, but there's nothing illegal about carrying a briefcase around with a hundred thousand dollars in it. Um, yeah. Um, so I don't think that that's legal. Um, we, watched uh, right before I came to Dragon Con, um, someone mentioned, uh, and we, we watched a video on it on during the police encounters about DEAs uh, searching people's bags and give, requiring people to either miss their flight to stay with their stuff or go on with their flight. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that I have a whole lot of problems with that. Um, even as a someone who generally defends law enforcement, um, you know, at, at that point, I think that what they are, their angle is to say that it might be abandoned property. Um, it, when it's, you know, when someone leaves their bag to catch their flight. Um, mm -hmm. But that the whole thing with the DEA, um, I think, is corrupt. And a judge will very soon throw that out um, if it hasn't happened already. Um, I hope. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as tra just traveling, I don't know of anything that's illegal about just I, I don't think that they could just take your legally. I mean, they could physically take it from you. And if mm -hmm. they do just memorialize it as best you can. Um, but uh, it, it, I don't think that they can legally just take a hundred thousand dollars unless they have evidence of some sort of crime. Okay. And then the other thing is just traveling in general. 
in Colorado, I can buy, you know, people can grow up to six plants on their own. And then if they're just on the road traveling, at what point does traveling for vacation and you've got something where you cross the state line into Georgia or wherever? That's a whole nother panel. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, we got we're, we're we're out of time, but we will take this one question real quick. We'll lighten fast. Answer. The changes you were discussing, right? The increase in the burden of proof, et cetera. What's the current state in Congress? Like, is that almost approved? Still in discussion? That's going to lead me to my uh, next point. Write your Congress people uh, and tell them how you feel about civil asset forfeiture and the needed reforms. Uh, and and write your local legislators and city councilmen and everybody else you can do. There's really very few better things you can do than to be a fly in the ointment and annoy people uh, because they actually listen to you at some point, um, hopefully. Uh, but really, most of them do listen to if they get overwhelming response about issues. So, uh, yeah, we, we need to move them along and get more and more reforms. So um, great question, though. Uh, don't forget to rate this panel. It's been a great time. If you would give our volunteers a round of applause. So I have what can I can I add into your to your comment? Sure. Legally, if you write to your congressman, there are three, right? Two senators yeah. and thing, they have to have a staffer who actually records your version. So yeah. they have 40 things, topics, and they'll go, okay, this person feels this way about it, this person feels this way. They have to record it and they have to acknowledge it. Yep. They don't have to do what you want, but yep. they have to know about it. So um if anybody wants to see, I actually um have access mobile access to like the the prosecutor database like my form that i give people the notice of seizure i can pull that up uh, after the panel if anybody would like to see it thank you thank you